Hello people of Facebook, uh, <clears throat> welcome to another instalment of uh, my Q&A, things on a Sunday. I'm at the earlier time of 1pm today, so apologies if you're expecting to see me a little bit later on, but I've got some civilian stuff to do, you know, real uh, life things. Um, <clears throat> so I'm hoping that, uh, that some of you guys can join me today, uh, and if not, you can always catch up on these things on uh, later on on Facebook and also I'm posting them uh, just as a matter of, of kind of uh, habit now posting these things up on YouTube so we're building up quite a, a repository of, of information there this is the ninth one by my reckoning so soon into double figures next week I may celebrate the uh, the tenth one with maybe a slightly different format I'm looking into uh, perhaps doing a zoom lesson with as many of you guys as, uh, as as the Zoom can handle, I'm not entirely sure what the maximum number is, but then it'd be it'd be good to do something that's interactive where you can actually uh, we can see each other. That would be really nice. So I'm still thinking about how to go about doing that. Uh, so this week I'm playing a different guitar. Uh, this is a beautiful nylon string guitar made for me by uh, the amazing luthier uh, Rob Aylward. And what I'd like to do to begin with, if uh, if I may, is play a tune. Excuse me. Uh, off the last album, this is a song from uh, the last record called I Remember Paris and it's kind of a um, a reworking of a Thin Lizzy classic called Boys Are Back In Town but played in a sort of a bossa nova style. Now in jazz that's referred to as a contrafact when you take the chord sequence and structure of a, of a unique piece or of an of a, um, established piece, forgive me, and you rework the melody, you write your own melody over it and against it. Uh, and it happens a lot. You hear, particularly in, in the bebop era, you know, such a lot of Charlie Parker's tunes are actually uh, the harmony is pre-existing. Check out, you know, Ornithology, and then listen to How High the Moon, and you'll see it's the same chord structure. And on it goes. You know, it's something that's part and parcel of the uh, the compositional uh, methodology of jazz, for want of a, of a more concise way of saying that. Uh, okay. So anyway, with, without further ado, I'll play it for you and then I'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing. I'm going to try and keep this, the idea with this piece is it's quite simple, harmonically speaking. It's pretty much B flat major, other than the introduction and a little tag in the middle. And then there's one instance where it goes from B flat major to an E flat minor to A flat seven chord. So it deviates at that point. But otherwise, in terms of the improvisation, you could play B flat major scale over everything. So I'm going to be drawing from a B flat major tonality that at some point you'll hear a shift where you'll hear an E flat minor going to an A flat seven. Sometimes it's called backdoor changes when you do that. You go four minor, flat seven. Um, anyway, let's hear it first and then uh, we'll talk about it in a moment.
nerve wracking again. Yeah. Um, it's a funny thing, uh, not playing to an audience, playing to a camera. Uh, so it's something you might want to consider when practicing. Uh, if you really want to figure out where you're at with a particular thing, try filming yourself. Uh, I don't know if, if you suffer from the same thing that I, I seem to suffer from, which is when I think I've got something down, I generally try and record it, store things on my phone. And uh, very often I think I've got it nailed. And then when I try and record it, it takes like six takes before I get anything resembling something that I could bear to listen to. Uh, so that's saying something about dealing with pressure. Or maybe it's that, but it's probably also to do with the fact that when you know something's being preserved, even if it's just for yourself, then usually speaking, your quality control goes up. So when you practice, if there's any fluff notes or notes that are half hit or a little bit late or a little bit early, sometimes we let them go unchallenged. We don't question them. We think, oh, that's okay, that's fine. Um, but when you know it's being watched, like in this instance, or you know that it's being uh, recorded, then very often something that you might let slide becomes a problem. Uh, I've done things for guitar techniques where I've took six or seven takes to play something where I've literally been going because I didn't like the way that I slid off the nose at the end. Now, in practice, I probably wouldn't give that a second's thought, but when you hear it back, you think, okay, there's little tiny things that maybe are inconsequential, but cumulatively make a big, uh, they make a big kind of uh, contribution to the way you sound. They all start to, uh, to have an impact on, uh, on how you perceive a performance. So anyway, so that's maybe just a little bit of a, of a kind of a thought-provoking thing to, uh, to to begin with today. So what's happening in this tune, as I say, uh, the harmony comes from the Thin Lizzy song, Boys Are Back In Town. Uh, so you'll hear that a lot in jazz, as I said before before I played it, and it's referred to as a contrafact. Uh, so it's essentially B-flat major. The, the progression is B-flat major. All these chords coming from B-flat major. And then there's one instance when it goes. I don't think it does that chord in the thing this one, but it definitely does this. Where it goes four chord minor. So at that point, if I'm playing B flat major over all this stuff, I need to reflect that change. That needs to happen in the uh, the melody that I'm playing. Uh, so at that stage, I shifted. You could go to like a kind of a an E flat melodic minor if you wish. The only thing is with that, it doesn't give you this. Just give us that chord. That's what it does. Yeah, it will do, but with a uh, with a uh, raised eleven. So that's that's possible. But I think I play. type ideas but both of those things are, 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 uh, are available to you so my first point today very very quickly is you should try um, to really make the major scale work for you I alluded to it last week I think sometimes what we think when we when we're going to play jazz you think you need to know all this complex stuff you know if, if you don't know your uh, your Lydian dominant from your altered dominance from your you know uh, mixer Lydian flat six or whatever then you're never going to make a jazz musician. But plenty of those players, you know, there's plenty of amazing players out there who, who didn't know any of that stuff, you know, who could just hear it's the major scale with some things changed here and there, with the odd note twisted or a few notes added. So I would suggest, you know, maybe take a back in like this and see what you can do with just the major scale. I'm just, I'll drop in and just do a little excerpt of this tune from like when the, uh, the solo starts. So, okay. So this is just B flat major scale with that change I said before.
major scale, but try as best as I can to not just play it as a scale, just as a scale. So trying to find melodies. So this is something we're going to touch upon a little bit later on. We're going to talk about the idea of like hearing what you play. So even though I'm not actually singing out loud, as I'm playing, I am uh, I'm hearing these things in my head. Uh, let me just check the tune for a second. So this guitar is beautiful, but I, I made the rookie mistake of putting new strings on this a day ago. And now I want string guitars, as anyone who's got one will know. They stretch like crazy for ages. They stretch for a long time. Okay, so let's get on to some topics for today then. So the first thing I want to look at is a question from James uh, relating to a particular rhythm, like a rhythmic phrasing thing that he'd heard uh, me do and certainly heard other players do, uh, based around, uh, like, it sounds like it's a five-note motif, but what it is, is in bebop and, and those kind of eras of jazz, you hear this rhythmic motif happening all the time, which is a combination of a triplet with two quavers across two beats. So you get three and two, three and two. Or you can flip it round and you get two and three. So things like this. Right? So I'm going to give you like a, a set phrase. And maybe I'll do it in B flat so it fits with this um, harmony you've been listening to. So we have C minor and I'll do like a, an F7 and a flat 9 and a B flat major 7. So maybe if I play a phrase like this. Something like so. And that's like a classic bebop phrase, the kind of thing you might hear Charlie Parker play. Or any of those amazing guitar players who, who listen to Parker, like uh, Jimmy Rainey's good for this kind of stuff. Um, he's definitely listened to Charlie Parker probably more than he's listened to a guitar player, I would guess. So, in this particular phrase, and this is a set phrase, uh, the rhythm here is going to be based around groups of three and then groups of two. So our first phrase is in C minor, and I think I played. Uh, uh, So I went. So that's a C minor seven arpeggio. With the uh, an approach note to begin with, so B to C, and that's on the and of four, two, three, four, and. Then we have a triplet, triplet, or one triplet, one triplet, two. which is approaching the major third of the F7. So they have swing eights. Then a little kind of, this is kind of a gypsy type. So with this particular uh, triplet-y type da -da 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 thing, you can either play this like a triplet and go or both, you have a choice, or you can do it like a dotted as if it's a um, two semiquavers at the end, so it's one da 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 da. Like, so the first two are the first two parts of the swing eight notes, and the last two notes are twice as fast in the smaller space. So it's probably easy to just hear it. choice depends upon the speed okay so and then the next place is B flat major 9 or B flat major 7 look like so and that's kind of a Borelli like a 
it transcribed that phrase from Borelli Legrand about 20 years ago or something. Uh, so that's a major 7 arpeggio. Resolve into the 6. Or you could argue it's going in that case to, uh, to a G7. So, so in total, the whole phrase. ideas that you hear that kind of rhythmic idea it's just it's all over bebop it's like in gypsy jazz where you hear Certain rhythms that you hear time and time again, and in bop it's but da 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 in the so in that case it's the triple coming first, two, three, triple and so on, or triple triple two and and so on. Now you can flip it round, you could go uh, it's where you have the the quavers first and then the triplet second. Um now, the only problem with this is you have to be a little bit careful of the fact that this is a language of a bygone era. This is akin to a, a rock guitar player uh, knowing how to... Sorry, I'm just going to turn this microphone in this guitar, which is feedback. Um, it's akin to a rock guitar player knowing how to go... And trying to pass that off as 2020, you know. Of course, if you hear any guitar player go doing that kind of stuff, it just instantly sounds like Chuck Berry from the you know the 60s or, or, or whatever, maybe even the 50s, in fact. Uh, so the same thing, you know. If, if I'm trying to pass off that kind of phrasing, it's the phrasing of uh, of, of Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and those kind of guys, you know. Uh, so. It's, it's one part of being able to play jazz, but it's not the only part. So we're going to look at ways of how you might take those type of ideas and make them sound more modern. So I'm hoping that all of these things are areas that you might be interested in developing. So, so that rhythm is something to really work on. So, and you often find it associated with like arpeggio based playing. Things, a lot of these lines are based on the interval of thirds. <laughs> set one to get you going. So at this point I wanted to mention the value of transcription. Um, a lot of these phrases that I play now just without really thinking about them they're just embedded in my mind in terms of I can hear them without the guitar, without having to have a guitar in my hands. They've come from listening to my favourite records and listening to players that I admire and getting stuck in and transcribing and somewhere I've got to lock up uh, full of guitars, which uh, which is nice, and somewhere at the bottom of all that, with, with a big pile of guitars on top of it, is a folder that for me was the year when I started learning to play jazz. Uh, I set myself a goal to transcribe a phrase every day for 365 days, and I kept to it. And somewhere in those 365 licks is something that sounds like... <laughs> Might have been that actually, and it came from Pirelli Legrand's Standards album, the Blue Note record that he did, where he plays uh, Donnelly and Days of Wine and Roses and all those kind of tunes. And that was a phrase that at the time it just stood out, and I thought, okay, what is that phrase? How would you play that? Where where might you use it? Um, and then consequently, every time that I hear anyone else playing it now, I kind of possess that idea. It's mine. It's something that I can use too. Uh, and I'm not suggesting Borelli invented this, but it was something that he used more than once on that record. Um, and pre there was a before and after. There was a before I knew what it was, and then by transcribing it, there's the after. Now I understand what it is. It's a major seven idea using a particular rhythmic concept that I hear everywhere now. 
and it's almost unavoidable. Once you've transcribed something, you begin to hear it everywhere, which is a really, really great thing. It's the best way to sort of unpick the music, I would suggest, you know, to kind of dissect what's going on so that when things are happening and it's all coming at you thick and fast, you can understand, you know. It's probably the difference between, you know, learning to speak French by, you know, reading a textbook, and that's one way. And then you go to France and you hear people speaking French around you, and it's too quick, you know. But occasionally you'll pick out the odd phrase. You think, oh, okay, I know what that means. You know, I figured out what savoir means or whatever. So, and then you'll hear it being used. So that's like being getting into jazz and then hearing, but da ba ba da ba da. Okay, now I know what that is. So anytime I hear anyone going, you know, boom ba da 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 ba ba, which is the reverse, you know, the, the two before the three. Rhythmically, it's not going to confuse me. It's going to be something that I kind of think, okay, I know that. That's something that I know, and I'm unlikely to forget. Whereas if I let someone else do it all for me, uh, then you don't have that first-hand experience, meaning, you know, let's just get a book of bebop licks and work through them. The problem with them is how do you develop a relationship with those ideas that they really stick? So for me, you know, will always be Borelli the Grand Standards album, you know, even though I hear it on a million and one other things and I use it myself, that's where it came from. I'm not going to forget it, I wouldn't have thought. So consequently, I don't need to keep practicing it all the time because it's there, you know, these things are there. So I would suggest transcribing is, is something to do. Do a little bit of it. You know, if you don't want to write these things down, then just transcribe by ear. You know, I'm sure that's what Borelli did. Borelli can't read and write music to the best of my knowledge. So, but he's definitely listened to Django and, um, and he can play all those things, you know. They're, in, they're, they're kind of in his vocabulary, as it were. Uh, and it's a really powerful thing to do. I think I would suggest that, uh, you know, with, with a few rare exceptions, it's what most good players seem to have done, you know. There are some players who claim to have never transcribed, but they may be fortunate in the fact that they might be surrounded by music. You know, if you lived in your, your Harlem in the 1950s or whatever, then you could probably go and see the Count Basie band and next door Dizzy Gillespie was playing or whatever. And you're surrounded by music, it's inevitable you're going to hear jazz in a certain way. Whereas... If you're like me and I was brought up on the Beatles and, and Jimi Hendrix and all that kind of stuff, then being able to hear and understand what Duke Ellington's doing and figuring out what the you know what the rhythms are that, that Miles is playing, that, that's not first language for me, that's second language. I had to kind of jump start that and one of the ways to do it was by transcribing stuff, you know. Uh, so that would be my uh, my point here about that. So try and do as much of that as you can. Um, you don't have to do loads of it actually but do some of it you know some's better than not okay so the other point i wanted to make about this i'm just checking with my notes with this particular phrase you may have noticed a kind of an unusual finger in here for the major seven arpeggio so i'm playing uh, b flat major seven conventional b flat major seven arpeggio is usually played like something like this This is a bit like, right, I'm going to say like refingering. This is the, this topic, if you want to put a title on it, we can call this refingering for expression purposes. Right? So coming at this from the blues, which is where I came at guitar from, for blues rock. Right? If I was playing B flat minor pentatonic scale, I probably wouldn't dream of ending a phrase like this. Like that. Right? Because what can I do with that note? Not a great deal. Whereas if I go... If I refinger that B flat note and I put it on the B string, obviously not on this guitar, but on any other guitar, you can bend to it, you can slide to it, you can jump to it, you can hammer on to it. Whereas this kind of feels, you can maybe do that, but it still feels kind of weak. So likewise, uh, so refingering it means that I can be more expressive. If I play on major seven arpeggio with the same philosophy, right? What can I do with that? You know, well, you could do that cliche line, which is, you know, kind of, it's up there with the lick, you know, you know that kind of thing. That's not a million miles away from playing the lick. Uh, that doesn't feel like I can do a great deal with that particular note in that location. Whereas if I place, if 
I place it on the B string, again, that might have come from Borelli, Days of Wine and Roses. The start of Days of Wine and If you listen to that tune, So again, it's funny how these things that I transcribed years and years and years ago still make an appearance in my playing. So that by placing that note on the B string, it allows us to do more expressive things such as the hammer on. Or to slide. And if we were playing on a steel string guitar, you could bend to it. You know. So always be on the lookout for these things. So even though you might see a really efficient fingering, like so. And I'm not saying don't play that, but I'm also saying be on the lookout for things like where you might read. So here's the same arpeggio three different ways. which they all have different potential from a phrasing perspective so that would be the next point just be aware of like playing around with fingerings uh, so instead of that not always being there it could be here it could be here. so on and so forth so that kind of uh, Knowing the fingerboard well enough to be able to move stuff into different locations is a, is a good thing, I would say. So I'm hoping that wraps up that first idea, James, and, and you got something from that. So just to recap one more time, the lick that I played, if I remember it rightly, was... Something like that, yeah. yeah. Or any variation there on it. Okay, so I'm going to move on to another topic now. So this is... All of this stuff is going to kind of, uh, it's all going to connect together, right? even though we can, we can look at a kind of a, like a global concept of being able to hear what you play, this is what our topic is, but within this global idea of being able to hear what you play, play what you hear, there are other like specific things that we can take from that. So within this, the big heading of I want to be able to hear everything that I can play, there are other things that are kind of smaller skills that you can use to get to that point. So the first thing I'm going to look at is a little concept and a, and a, and a challenge I'm going to uh, give you over the next 12 days. Right? If you can give me 12 days to practice this, then uh, I guarantee your, your musicianship will improve. Um, could improve exponentially if you've not done this kind of thing before. Of course, if you've done it before, then uh, it's always good to revise these things. So over the course of 12 days, what I'm going to ask you to be able to do within, so uh, if you stick at this, if you do it every day, uh, of course, is to be able to hear a different note each day over any of the types of harmony that you commonly hear in jazz or in blues or rock or what have you but if we deal with you know the jazz idiom for the moment with offshoots into things like blues and rock generally speaking you're dealing with three predominant sounds it's usually major stuff major seven things maybe six chords things that are major it's minor and then there's, there's things that relate to, pertain to minor or it's a dominant seventh and there's things different kind of subcategories within each of those but essentially, it's either a major sound, it's a dominant sound, or it's a minor sound. And you could argue that things like diminished could fit into dominant if we look at the material we looked at last week where we saw the connection between diminished and dominant. Or it could be a sound of its own right. So if you're interested in how diminished can be a sound in its own right, check out last week uh, where we looked at that in depth. <clears throat> and that's usually when it's a diminished seventh one chord. 
as opposed to anywhere else where more often than not it's a disguised diminished seventh one chord or it's some kind of dominant seventh uh, you know with a uh, with fancy dress on if you like uh, okay so if we just work on the principle today of dominant seven that's what I'm going to look at today is just dominant seven right? and you're going to give me 12 days on this right what I want you to be able to do is each of the 12 days we're introducing a new note so the first day you've got a pretty easy day all right so today you can uh, you can rest easy this one isn't particularly hard okay so I'm gonna get my little loop thing on the go here and I think I have uh, yeah C7 yeah. so coming here boom. I mean, really hear it. I mean, clearly hear that that's boom. That's the root note. Okay. And you might at this stage be thinking, this is dumb. This is this is silly. It's uh, it's no use at all, right? But trust me, things will ramp up throughout the course of the twelve days. So day one, you've got to be able to hear boom. And it might be a good opportunity to challenge yourself to see, okay, can you play that like every string? Can you do you know where all the notes are everywhere on the guitar? So then the next note that I'm going to add, I'm going to add the perfect fifth, right? uh, because that's a note that's common throughout all the harmony, you know, you find a perfect fifth in major, you find it in minor, you find it dominant, although it can be altered, it can be in minor as well, and in major for that matter. But uh, to hear the perfect fifth is a good, um, that's a good next step. just being able to hear it above and below so meaning when you invert it so meaning if I go from C to G that's a perfect fifth if we go from low to high and now if I go from C to G below you could argue then a fourth apart but it's still the fifth interval in relation to the key right but the point of this is I don't want you to hear these things using what we call sequential memory sequential memory is a bit like if I said what's the fifth digit of your mobile phone number for the most part, you've got to go through the first four to get to the fifth one. Uh, or what's the 17th letter of the alphabet? You know, I, I don't know what that is. Right? Um, and for me to be able to know what it is, I'd have to go A, B, C, D and count them and then find out which is the 17th. So <clears throat> whilst for the alphabet or for a long number like your phone number, uh, there's no real point to be able to just jump in the middle. But with music, there might be, you know, because I might want to go... So you have to go one, two, three, four, five to get to that note. So I want to go ba -da 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 -da, and hear that note. Okay. So without having to go one, two, three, four, five, I want to be able to go ba. And hear what the five sounds like, and that's day two. That's what the five sounds like, and where is it? You know, okay, so it could be there, or it could be there. So usually, what you find with intervals, they're in one of two directions. They're going to be going away from you, you know, like, like so. That way, or they're going to be going that way, or even is a part so in that case you could call that a 12th I guess um, but it's still can I hear what that sounds like the five if I can't I'm guessing right when I'm playing if you can't hear it you're, you're guessing now that said and done all right this is a two-way street all right so this concept of play what you hear right is also hear what you play so I personally couldn't hear a perfect fifth until I'd gone a million times. You know. Okay, now I've played that. Pay attention to what I've played, and then that becomes a sound that you hear. So it's a two-way thing. You know, you have to sometimes play things in for them to then come out as things that you can hear. So pay attention when you play 
if you're playing a pattern and you're not really 100% sure what it's going to sound like, pay attention to that so that then the next time that you want to recreate that sound, you know what it is. So, so that's what I would suggest. So how I see tonalities is like a series of concentric rings, like kind of like, uh, let me turn the volume down, like as if you've got these sort of, sort of uh, uh, like fields of orbit around the center of gravity, which is the tonic. So in C7, right in the middle, right, rather than seeing a scale and a line, right in the middle C exists, and that's like the sun, you know, everything revolves around the sun, yeah. The next level, or the next layer, if you, if you want to think of it that way, is the notes that belong in the triad. So we've already dealt with the fifth, then the major third, so you might want to ask yourself, that's where the major third is. that is and again down. be able to hear that you know so if we can't hear it down, boom, that's the major third now you don't need to be a great singer I'm certainly not a great singer but I can hear down, down. I can hear that that's where the third and the fifth are okay so that's like the next layer if you like root in the center and then day two, we hear the five. Day three, we hear the major third. Okay. And then day four, we maybe hear the, the, the notes that can be added to the chord to extend the chord. So that would be maybe slightly closer to the sum, would be the seven. In this case, dominant seven. great singer but you can hear that you can hear that so now with this is beginning to rack up now we've got four notes that's four days in so I'd say the next few days you want to hear the notes that can be added to the chord without creating tension so that might be things like um, the ninth the natural nine Down. that's what that sounds like Boom. and that if you know I feel good you know. The 13 or the, the 6, you know. Now I did something a bit sneaky there. What, what I did there is I played what should in principle not work. Now I would include against dominant chords it's quite close actually uh, to the center as it were the minor third I mean you might think well minor third surely that's a wrong note but what's happened is it's become a sound that we that we associate with the blues stick that closer than say something like a flat nine so the flat nine sounds more like a tension whereas the the sharp nine or minor third if you want to call it that is uh can be used in a more of a static like non-functioning you know jam situation where you stay on that chord for an extended period of time okay so if we factor that in uh what we have now is center of the universe the root then the next level we have the root three five or maybe next to root five then root three five and then notes we can add to that chord the seven the six we could add the nine so pick a key 
key, maybe you can sing. You know, da, 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 da. And it doesn't matter if you're in the wrong octave. I'm not in the right octave if I go ba. But it's clear that I know ba. That's what the nine sounds like. Okay. You could add the eleven. Da. That's that note. You know. Da, 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 or the raised eleven. Depends what goes with it, which way you call it, really, uh, and you see both. <clears throat> so at that stage, by the time we get there, we're, you know, we're really racking up the notes. We've so far we've had the root, we've had the the fifth, that's two. We've had the major third, that's three. But the flat seven, that's four. Then we had the the nine, five, eleven, uh, sorry, thirteen, uh, six, eleven. Seven, sharp eleven, eight, uh, minor third, nine. We're nearly there with all twelve. There's only three missing. There's only three that are not there. So what are those three that are not there? Well, you have a raised five. That's one. So that's that sound. Sound. Sometimes that's there instead of the five. Usually when it wants to go, uh, when it's a sharp five, usually wants to go up. Whereas if it's there as well as the five, usually wants to kind of go down and it's associated with minor. But we can look at things like the semantic differences between sharp fives and flat sixes on another week if you're if you're interested. All I care about is that you can hear it today. And now what you might want to do for things like sharp fives, whilst I said uh, sequential memory sometimes doesn't help because it's not quick enough, right? you can use uh, an, associate, an association interval, if you like, to find an interval you're not that clear with. So if you know that it goes, the perfect fifth, there's a raised five. So here, boom, 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 and there's our flat five. Now, another way to to hear these other intervals is to take something that's inside. If you if you like sequential memory, if that's something that you find it helpful, is we can add these notes to a sound that we're familiar with, like mixolydian. So that's I think that's pretty much everything we have played so far in one thing. You know, that we said roots, we've done that. We said two, we've done that. We said three, we also said minor three. So for now, we'll just forget the minor third just for a moment. There's a major third, perfect fourth, we said. We also said flat five, but we'll, we'll scratch that for a moment. Five, six, flat seven. So we can add the missing notes as chromatic intervals. So if I say a sharp five or in this case, I'm going to think of it as a flat six. to create different scales. The reason why I'm suggesting if you can do this, you don't necessarily need to know the names of the scales. If you can hear all 12 intervals, then why do I need to know that this is called Phrygian dominant? If I can hear... That's a four. Excuse 
my terrible singing. So, how about taking that on board uh, as a, a, a challenge over 12 days? So, I'll run through them one at a time. Do this group of 12. Let's so day root. Then, day two, perfect fifth. Major third, day three. Down. Maybe nine, da da. Day six, the sixth, da 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 da. Da da, the eleven, sharp eleven, da. Boom, da da. Sharp five, perhaps. Da da. Flat seven. Uh, sorry, flat second. Forgive me. I knew that. I said the wrong name. I knew which one I was aiming for. Right. Uh, so the only one that I don't think I've dealt with so far is the major seven. So everything that's every note all 12 notes but dealt with in a way that actually makes some sense as opposed to doing this great what's the fifth one sound like <laughs> we're back to letter 17 in the alphabet again aren't we you need the scaffolding of having everything else around it for you to be able to feel secure in playing the right notes whereas we should be able to just jump in on any notes you know so so Give that a go, see how you get on with that over the next two weeks, 12 days. Uh, and then what happens once you've done that, we do the same thing against major. And you see if you can hear all 12 notes against major, what they do, what effect they have. And some of them, you know, you might think, oh, okay, sharp five feels a bit unresolved, you know. So which way do you want to go? Or do you want to go? I'm hoping that this is making some sense to you. Uh, but 12 days is nothing, man. If you, if you spent if you, if you spent 10 times that amount of time, and at the end of it you could hear all 12 notes, you'd thank me for it, I think. Uh, be able to access all 12 notes would be a really, really valuable skill for any musician. And at some stage, you know, when you're playing, you want to be able to use every note. I'm sure if I transcribe what I played in that tune at the start, I think every note makes an appearance at some point. Even though it's quite a diatonic, like diatonic harmony structure, that doesn't mean to say that over like, something that's very much in this case B flat major sounding that I can't play every note. So that might be the next thing for us to look at. Uh, so I'm going to move on to a related topic now. Uh, I've had some great, great suggestions. So, so thanks Tony and Andy for, for suggesting that idea of ear training. I'm also going to do the opposite of that, like finger training, like, and how can playing things that maybe are outside your realms of hearing actually expand what you can hear. Um, so both of these things are connected. I would suggest that the, the, the master, the maestro of, of all of this stuff is uh, the, the mighty Joe DiOrio. Uh, he was talking about a thing what he calls gesturing. 30 years ago, yeah. Um, so I know you might hear players like Julian Large talking about, he calls it kinesthetic curiosity, I think he calls it, which is great really. And what he's talking about is playing something that's motor skill derived, that maybe is outside your realm of hearing to begin with. And then that makes it within your realm of hearing. If you accept it and you pay attention to the sound that it creates. So uh, Joe DiOrio, talks a lot about the left hand right hand side of the brain balance uh, he's a really interesting guy I've got a lot from studying him and just listening to him what he's got to say and the way he plays uh, so the left hand side 
to do with verbal commands, structure, understanding concepts. Uh, what uh, I'm reading a great book at the moment, the Pressure Principle. What uh, Dave Alred he calls this the uh, the under the surface of the water, the iceberg that's under the surface of the water, as opposed to the tip of the iceberg, which is the sort of uh, um, so this would be like explicit as opposed to implicit. So this would be the left hand side of the brain really is to do with sort of explicit verbal con commands and understanding what we're doing. Uh, whereas, so that would be the stuff that's above the surface actually, sorry. Uh, whereas the right hand side of the brain arguably is to do with pictures and symbols and feelings and association of, of you know memories and the like. And it's more pictorial. Uh, so that would be the stuff that's kind of under the surface, the stuff that you deal with on a subconscious basis, uh, or implicit knowledge. So things that are not necessarily, uh, you don't necessarily need to, uh, to be thinking about them all the time. So for example, when I'm playing, it's a combination of two. Sometimes I'm not thinking at all, I'm just editing. And then other times I'm thinking, okay, here comes the E flat minor chord. So both of those things are valid and I think they need to be kind of in balance although I would say maybe weighted towards the uh, subconscious if you can do it it depends upon your familiarity with the material that you're playing of course okay so what uh, let me get you started I'm going to play five examples here uh, or maybe six okay so the first one okay so the first one we'll do with uh, is to do with gesturing which may mean taking a particular uh, idea and mimicking something from that idea. So I'll start with, uh, I'll, I've got a little loop prepared, C minor, yeah, yeah C minor. In oh, fact, no, I'll do, I'll do C7. Okay, so I'm gonna play a typical C7 phrase that, that's a cliche, yeah. So that's like that bebop language that, that I talked about at the start. So what we have here is an ascending group of thirds, like a G minor seven. Then we go down a step, like a uh, G minor six or an E half diminished. Okay, so that's a cliche phrase that you know. Uh, it's like. Or, or see, like that kind of thing, you know. I couldn't lay claim to have invented that phrase, could I? That would be ridiculous. Okay, so we've got. So what I can do, I can mimic the shape. So the shape is up four notes, then down a note, and then up four notes. So imagine if instead of choosing thirds, I choose. I choose that, right? So this is the same lick, but instead of thirds, I'm going to choose fourths. Instead of sounds a little bit more modern and sounds pretty much like Joe Diorio from being honest. Okay, so that and maybe expand it, maybe I'll do fifths. So I might go um something like that. Uh one more time, three, four. So that's the same shape, up four notes. Oh in this case this case instead of going down, maybe I'll do this, I'll go uh, Four notes ascent based on fifth intervals, and then down, down, and then up four, and down two. So I'm mimicking the contour of the idea. Does it make sense? So the 
this is what uh, Joe might call gesturing. So you've got like a kind of an idea of a, a hum, of a harmonic or a rhythmic or melodic shape, and you can just move that around. So he might go, you know, and I'm moving in and out of tonality. You know. It doesn't necessarily have to all be in, in the, the right inverted commas key. He's just moving a pattern around. Okay, so let's look at some patterns now. So if I say we take a, a, a pattern here, I'll do uh, G minor pentatonic. Uh, so now in this instance, I'll, I'll switch to C minor. So we'll C minor. So let's do some patterns. So, so these are the kind of things that, that uh, uh, Julian Large refers to, where he takes a conventional pattern like this. So if we do a conventional pattern like... Kind of quartal type. Miss a little bit of Joe Diorio with this. So Joe might do something where, say, every four notes we sidestep a semitone. So slowly it might sound like this. something like a pattern of four, so say we do a conventional pattern of four. Like so. Every four notes. I'll just play at half time, half speed. So, so I'll do a quarter speed actually, so it's all sidestep. And again. And again. And again. And again. A little bit quicker this time. So one of the ones Joe likes to play is this kind of thing. So that was uh, four consecutive fourths. So going from G, I'm going G, C, F, B flat. So that's like his gesture or his shape, if you like. And you could go. With semitones, in this case, he's going diagonally. And that's transcribed, that transcribed that exact phrase from a Joe Dorio solo, you know. So that's one pattern. Taken from Joe, right. a group, it's basically this. So, what this is, it's chromatic, five note pattern, and every third, this note goes up an octave. So that's 
kind of a pattern that I use a lot. Uh, so I'm hoping that, that this is helping. Now, what we can do as well with this sort of uh, gesture or, or, or physical shape thing is you can take something that's super uh, super comfortable and, and familiar to you. So say we, we take this idea, which we've played a few times. <laughs> which is pentatonic, yeah? Minor pentatonic. So I can take that idea, but I can play around with the note values. So instead of it being, in this case, you know, what we consider to be conventional minor pentatonic, root, minor third, uh, perfect fourth, Fifth, flat seven, octave, of course you know that because we can go boom, dun, 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 dun. You've practiced those intervals over the next 12 days. Okay, you've done that. Um, I can change the note values, so for argument's sake, if I wanted to play something that was associated with this chord. I talked about this last week. Diminished scale. Stopping me for instead of playing this, what's stopping me from going or from going? This is like the, the half whole version of it. So instead of playing all three notes, I'm going to play just two. Two, 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 two. two. So any of these gestures. That's the exact same pattern that I played a moment ago in pentatonic. I was did something like was it whatever it was. Or whatever you want it to be, you know, if I want it to be whole tone or something like that, I forgot whole tone scale. Uh, you might learn C whole tone scale. But I can also always go make it by dismissing notes what was the phrase I did that's that lick that's the that exact same pentatonic lick you know I, I was brought up with bands like Thin Lizzy you know so I knew all those all those kind of things before I even knew what the names of the notes were I could play that kind of stuff all right but then I figured out can I go you can play all those things in whatever tonality you wish and this is the kind of stuff that, that you hear uh, Julian Lars talk about where he talks about I think he takes something like that and he's going like moving things around in semitones until he finds something that he likes the sound of, uh, and then it becomes something that he hears. So, for example, I could not hear. You know, if you said to me before I played it a bunch of times, can you hear what that would sound like before in advance? Would you know with complete authority how those notes would sound? The answer to that would, at one stage, be no. But then I really made a point of. Um, trying to make the connection between the things that my fingers might play and the things that my ear might be able to hear. And if something is kind of outside of the outer reaches of that, then figure out what the problem is and really work on it. And I found for me, the problem was that when I learned scales and I could sing scales and the like, I could only sing them when you lean the notes against one another. Again, going back to our thing of what's the 17th letter of the alphabet. You, that's not good enough for what we need when we play music, particularly if you're an improviser. You don't want to have to go one, two, three, four, five, six to hit the sixth note of a scale. You want to be able to just go right to it. And that's how, uh, when you start combining these things together, because that's all arpeggios are, that's all chords are, that's all scales are. They're just different combinations and permutations of those 12 notes. That's all they are. If you can hear all 12, in principle, you, why do you need to know the names of any of them? If you can hear them, you can combine them together to create any kind of scale you like. And maybe that's not such a bad idea, you know? Let's make some five note pentatonic scales and we'll go like root, second, you know, minor third, flat five, 
well, how many is that? One, two, three, four, flat seven. That's it. Like, and make a pentatonic scale with that, you know. This is the kind of thing, if, if you're interested in uh, the guitarist Wayne Krantz has put together that book, The Improvisers OS, where he goes over all of those permutations. You know, uh, you see similar things in like the Sonimsky's Thesaurus of Scales and Melodic Patterns. Holdsworth uh, implies it as well, he said he took all the various different permutations of intervals. You know, and dismissed anywhere there was more than three semitones in a row, four semitones in a row, I forget. Um, and then classified them and found the ones that sounded good. So he doesn't know the names. Holdsworth didn't know the names. He might not necessarily know it's called harmonic major scale or whatever. Uh, although I'm sure, he, I'm sure he does know that, but he, that's not how he thinks of them. And Wayne Kranz just thinks of them in terms of formula. You know, this particular thing, whatever it might be, you know, is one, two, sharp, four sharp five or whatever it might be you know flat seven say and that could be a formula for him and creates a, a pentatonic scale or whatever number of notes he so chooses you know it could have two three four five six seven eight nine you know i would imagine that you know that there's an almost infinite number of permutations here so at some point you've got to stop to make this useful but it all boils down to the ability to hear each of the 12 notes independently. So that's my challenge to you for this week. I would suggest it's a good one. Uh, and it's hard, it's tough, you know. Uh, so you could do what I'm doing, you know, where you put a back in on. So we hear the rig boom, boom, sharp five, boom, go, boom, da, da, that's a flat five, boom. And a do down is a natural second. Da do is a flat seven. Da do is a six. A flat six is down. Challenge yourself, you know, can you hear? Da do major seven. And that's how we get one step closer to. Uh, being able to just think music rather than think uh, C mixolydian with a, you know, whatever it might be, flat second or whatever. We want to get to the stage where we bypass this. And this is where, you know, Django and all those guys lived. You know, they, they're, they're not thinking uh, this scale against that chord or whatever. What they're thinking is this sound against this harmony. Right? Now, the fact of the matter is we can look at it and go, it's this, you know, much the same as you can look at a Shakespearean sentence and analyze the, the grammar. That's not, I'm guessing that's not what was the intention at the time of, uh, of composition. Uh, but like all of these things, they'll respond to practice anyway. I'm hoping that, that if anything, uh, you just come out of this with a couple of ideas. I'm sure that some of this might not appeal to everybody, um, but I'm hoping something hits the spot, that there's going to be maybe one thing every week. Uh, I'm going to sign off in a second now. I'm hoping that, uh, that the moving of time has not been too, uh, too disruptive. It's not kind of messed things up for you. Um, thanks for your attention. I can see lovely, uh, uh, what do you call them, um, emojis. I can't figure out what they say because my eyesight's terrible. But uh, I'll check out the comments just as soon as we're done. Thanks once again. It's really uh, great to have your support. Uh, we're up to number 10 next week, which is great to be celebrated, I think. Uh, stay safe in the lockdown. Please keep the questions coming. I had some wicked questions. So I think that, that idea of um, being able to hear everything you play is a great question. So thanks. Andy and Tony both asked similar things. James for that bebop thing. Uh, and Jordan for mentioning the, the kinesthetic possibilities or curiosity that's what he that's what he called it which has prompted me to go into a bit of a tribute to joe diorio i can't say enough good things about him he's amazing uh, next week i'm going to kick off with some hybrid picking stuff uh, i wanted to devote some time to this and also maybe this isn't the right guitar for that you find that on acoustic guitar i find the difference between picked and fingers notes that you play with pick and notes you play with fingers is sometimes too marked it's too great Whereas on an electric guitar, you can blend the two and you can do some uh, interesting tricks, so to, shall we say, where you make fingers sound like pick and it makes it sound like you've got superhuman picking technique. 
So I'm hoping that that might be something you're interested in. Keep the questions coming. I can't do it without them. And uh, have a great rest of the weekend. It's looking quite sunny outside, so I'm going to uh, go and get some vitamin D or whatever it is. Uh, have a great day. Have a, uh, an, ev an equally great week. Keep the questions coming. And who knows? I may see you on a gig at some point. There's talk of gigs coming back. Hooray! You know, uh, that would be amazing um, if we can actually... Uh, be in the same room that would be fantastic so i'm going to have a little think about what we can do with regards to maybe doing a zoom session if not for week 10 then certainly coming up soon and if anyone's interested in that then let me know so that's something we could do sort of face to face virtually if that makes sense but uh, i'll look at the technology and see how that's going to work and it might be something that we do outside of facebook and i'll record it and then i'll post it onto facebook afterwards but leave that one with me keep your eyes uh on my Facebook channel and I'll make some uh, announcements once I figure that out. If not, I'll see you next week for a regular week uh, and that's something that we'll just look to do at some stage over the next week or two. Okay, enjoy your Sunday. Cheers.